to doing the work embedding anti-racism and decolonization in museum practice which is a series of practice focused workshops devised by the contemporary arts society and the decolonizing arts institute at the university of london there are eight workshops in this series each of which focuses on a different area of museum work the purpose of the workshops is to provide a space for people working in and with museums to talk openly about their experiences of trying to embed anti-racism and decolonization into their work, the challenges they're facing, and to come up with workable strategies that they can test back in the workplace. These sessions have been designed so that everyone attending will participate in an intimate setting and support each other to develop new and more effective ways of doing this work. <clears throat> As an organisation, a charity, the CAS is overwhelmingly white. In that we differ little from so many arts organisations across the UK. We approach the Do the Work programme this year in the spirit of learning alongside our museum colleagues, learning together because if we do not learn how to be part of the solution, then we will always be part of the problem. Because of the pandemic and the closure of so many of our museums, we seem to have arrived at an inflection point, a moment that seems ripe for reinventing the way that we do things. A return to normal when the health crisis is over would be a return to inequality. What we have now is a chance to grasp and embed change. Today's workshop focuses on interpretation practices in art museums and how anti-racist and decolonial approaches can be embedded into them. I have attended all of the seminars so far. I get an enormous amount out of the discussion. I, I hope that you will also today. Um, interpretation seems to be right at the very heart of what we do as uh, in our roles in museums. Um, so I'm looking forward to today's discussions very much indeed. Thank you everyone for attending and I'm now going to hand over to Ilaria and Anjali. Thank you. Well, um, oh, Hamad. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm definitely not Ilaria or Anjali, but I'm very happy to be in the room with them and, and with you all. Uh, my name is Hamad Nasser. Um, I'm a curator and researcher. Um, I'm co-curating uh, the British Art Show 9 um, and lead curator at, at the Herbert. Um, and uh, in with my sort of researcher hats on, I have fellowships both at the Paul Mellon Center and at the Decolonizing Arts Institute um, at the UAL, which is collaborating with uh, the Contemporary Art Society for this workshop which is the third of a series, uh, and this one will be focusing on interpretation in museums, galleries, and our heritage sites. Now, some of the questions that we may be considering in the next um, two hours or so will be, you know, what is our ambition for our interpretation materials? Not just to serve our existing audiences, um, but also how do we bring in um, audiences that may not see themselves as, as being included in the conversation. How do we give these um, hidden suppressed narratives voice uh, and privilege those that have been historically marginalized when we produce our labels, uh, when we hold talks, or produce any other interpretive material. And lastly, how do we do this in, in ways that we can be transparent about histories of colonial violence and racial oppression when interpreting artworks, while also allowing people to engage and, and appreciate, and dare one even say, enjoy uh, artwork? Um, so these are some of the questions that we will be um, dealing with over the next couple of hours together. Um, just a few words about the, the format and the running order. So we'll kickstart today with two um, wonderful speakers who will speak to you for, uh, for about 15 minutes, um, who will lay out some of the issues and challenges that we all face, and perhaps also point towards strategies uh, that they've deployed as to how to deal with them. 
you'll be hearing from the writer, poet, and artist Kairani Baroka, and from Miles Greenwood, who is the curator of the legacies of slavery and empire at Glasgow Museums. So between them, they'll speak for about half an hour. We will have a conversation um, amongst ourselves, but also opening up to your questions. And then just one hour in, we will take a, a comfort break and then go straight into our breakout groups, where we will each then have an opportunity to discuss one example from our working lives um, of where we've been challenging with um, or sort of grappling with or testing an approach that we've tried um, and we've learned from for, for better or worse, um, and then sort of share these tools and approaches and initiatives that we can perhaps go back to our respective working places and then test um, uh, in, in the future. The breakout group will also last for about an hour. Uh, and when we come back together, we'll get to share, you know, sort of few snippets from what all of you have been discussing within each group. Now, you've already received this by email, but just wanted to remind you um, that uh, this workshop is being recorded, but this recording will not be published. It will be held by the Contemporary uh, Art Society and used only for anonymized transcriptions, which will provide the basis for report on the workshop that you will all have access to. With that, I would like to hand over to Kairani Baroka. Kairani. Thank you very much, Hamad, for the introduction. Thank you to CAS at the Decolonizing Arts Institute for working together to bring us here, to Ilaria and to Anjali and to Miles, who I'm looking forward to hearing from, and to everyone here today who's a participant. Um, I'd like to give a little bit of a, an introduction to the specific case study that I'm going to be drawing from today. Um, Ilaria, if you could kindly share your screen, beginning of my um, presentation. If you scroll up, it has the title of the presentation. Thank you. Um, Assumptions and Ableisms in Decolonizing Arts Interpretations. So as the slide shows, I am a research fellow at UAL's Decolonizing Arts Institute. This year, I'm also associate artist at the National Center for Writing, and my writing spans performative in various forms of genre. Um, I am going to describe myself very briefly, uh, as we do in a lot of disability justice meetings. I'm an Indonesian woman with brown skin and red lipstick and earrings and a patterned black and white and brown dress. Behind me are two watercolor paintings that are framed and I have a stack of books to my right side. Um, so I'm going to be talking about an obsession of mine that took up a lot of my work uh, over the course of the past decade or so. Ilara, if you could kindly scroll down. Um, so the project that I'm speaking about is entitled Anna Infinite, and it was a series of performance installations, um, writings and poetry, fiction, nonfiction, mixed genre, um, and also illustrated um, digital collage and mixed media work. Um, all centered around one painting that I'm going to show you in a bit uh, called Anna Javanese, which was painted by Paul Gauguin circa 1893 to 1894 oil on canvas. Um, so the, Ilari, sorry, if you could just scroll up a little bit to the, that one. I just want to say that that was um, an example of one of the performance installations at Salts Basel in 2018, where I performed as various Annas. Um, and the, it, the main performance installation that I'm going to be discussing today is one in which I perform as myself, as Oka, and I'm speaking to various Annas. So um, if you could kindly scroll down to um, the next slide. Yes, thank you. Okay, so the painting that I was obsessed with and, and still am is um, the painting that you see projected onto the wall of the ICA. This is from my performance installation, Anna Nomenclature, um, in 2018 at the ICA. Uh, so there are two projections going on. The first in this performance installation is on the wall, and what you see there is the original painting by Paul Gauguin, but then also it's what you see projected on the wall are stills from essentially a short film I made that 
is timed with my performance installation. So as I'm talking about various things, different images relevant to my performance show up on the, on the back wall. And then what's projected from above is one of the digital collages I made based on the original painting. And I'm very subtly <laughs> performing from within the outline of Anna as a supposedly Javanese child, and I'm a Javanese woman. Um, and I am reinscribing with uh, white crayon in, in white outline on the floor of the ICA, the outline of this child. So I was really interested in this, in, in just proving one thing with all of my work around this, which also uh, formed my PhD by practice at Goldsmiths and Visual Cultures and um, was the basis of an essay uh, at, in the White Review, that you, the, an excerpt of which is online if you search for Anna Infinite and my name. So I wanted to say that there's the possibility that this painting could have been a painting of a child in pain, in chronic pain, and or a disabled child. Um, that may seem like a very simple statement, but in terms of the opposition that I got to that interpretation, it just illustrated how deeply ableist and how um, deeply colonial the ableist interpretations are of visual art. So a little bit of background. I myself am disabled and chronically ill. I have been over the course of my life disbelieved by many doctors and hospitals and so-called neurologists and people on the street. And <laughs> I've been just, and people in my life who have um, not believed that I have been in acute pain. Uh, and I felt a strange sense of kinship with this child. Um, because, and I don't know why, maybe it's because we are both Japanese, but also the more I researched um, this painting and the story of the, the, the child behind it, I became aware that these were children. Because in various art historical interpretations and, and writings on Gauguin, you'll get every detail about Gauguin's life, but in terms of the subject of this painting, the ethnicity is different every single time almost in every single art historical text that is supposedly fact and non-fiction. Um, this child is, is described as variously half Javanese, half Dutch, half Indian, half Malay, Sinhalese, Polynesian, um, you name it, as long it doesn't, it doesn't matter what colony she's from as, as long as they're from a colony, right? Um, so it made me realize, well, actually all of these art historical texts are fictions. People, these are just white people making up what this child was, right? These are already fictions. So I think the most ethical thing for me to do, rather than reinscribe violence, is to just write about literally a million and one different possible Annas to show that every single interpretation that we could possibly have is already fiction because only that child will know what that child went through or those children because there are various uh, photographs and, and, and portrayals of someone supposedly called Anna the Javanese, Anna la Javanese, where the faces are different and they can't tell brown children from each other, right? Or it will be this Anna print, um, but in the Tate Library, it was described as a print of a Polynesian child, right? And I uh, I had to tell um, a couple of very prominent artists who had taken that print out on loan, who were studying Polynesian girls in Gauguin's oeuvre, <laughs> that, that this was called Anna la Javanese and they had no idea, right? So the colonial fuzzy imaginary of the globe shapes contemporary art making. Um, and I'm just going to tell you about two different pushback stories I got in terms of the interpretation of this work. Um, Ilaria, if you could kindly just scroll through the next few slides. Um, in the, that's another one of my digital collages. Of uh, It has a the outline of the painting essentially in black and white with Javanese across the eyes and an alien Anna, which is one of my <laughs> science fictional interpretations of Anna, uh, in blue, it's a hand with an eraser. And if you could scroll downwards again, um, that is part of the film where I talk about the age of consent being 13 in France at the time. And that is why, although the ethnicity of this child differs every single time, the age of the child does not. It's always 13 or above or around 13. And that was to preserve the innocence, so to speak, of Gauguin. But let me tell you the most 
likely um, quote unquote reliable source as to who this child actually was. So according to Gauguin's art dealer, uh, there's a white opera singer named Nina Pack who said at one point to a banker friend of hers who worked in, the, in Malaya, as it was called at the time, I would like a little Negro girl. And not long after that, a small brown child, um, feminine presenting, appeared on the streets of Paris with a sign around their neck saying, I'm from Java, please give me to Nina Pack. And a police officer, again, the you know complicity of the police in slavery and oppression, brought this child to Nina Pack where they were immediately employed as a quote unquote domestic servant, but was actually a slave. Right, um, so slavery in what is now known as Indonesia, where I'm from, and what was formerly known as the Dutch East Indies, um, lasted for two centuries and affected um, more than you know a million or so men, women, and children. Um, and if you scroll downwards again, please, Ilaria. Um, so I connect the interpretations of Anna today to the very real way in which young black and brown children are over-sexualized, made to seem more mature than they are, and um, connect it to what domestic workers, foreign domestic workers today from the Philippines and Indonesia, for example, continue to face, which is essentially slavery conditions. Um, and if you scroll down again, please, Ilaria, um, and that's me again performing. I also want to say that, um, the way in which Anna came to Gauguin was, there are various stories about this, but uh, you know, in Mario, Mario Vargas Llosa's quite troubling interpretation of this in one of his novels, um, essentially Anna was given to Gauguin as a present. Uh, and Gauguin is a known abuser. Um, his son has written about Gauguin hitting his mother and of course, a man known for abuse and for dealing with all manner of children in non-consensual ways can hardly be described as a very good quote unquote partner. And yet Anna is continuously described as a mistress. Um, and if you scroll down once again, Ilaria. So that's again, the, the two interpretations that I um, would like to share here very briefly. One, I was once invited to lecture at an MA fine arts course on this project. And in the middle of my lecture, a white woman interrupted me and said, Brooke Shields was also photographed as a young child and she was white. First of all, never do that to anybody. That's very rude. <laughs> Second of all, yes, that is also awful. And it is also awful how this white woman arts lecturer felt that it was appropriate to pit two survivors or victims of hypersexualization of children against each other because of race. And also it wasn't getting the point that I've been trying to make with this long project, which is that colonialism um, makes black and brown children even more vulnerable than children already are, right? Um, and also being Javanese, in Javanese culture, we have disabled gods, but those interpretations were nearly completely wiped out due to the advent of colonial Western medicine and Dutch missionary hospitals. Um, and so, the ways in which people interpreted Anna as being automatically non-disabled before the interpretation that they could have been disabled, which chronic pain was very likely for somebody who was treated as a slave by various people, right? Because of abuse, physical, sexual, et cetera. It's a very clear possibility. The pushback that people had in their minds is related to colonial visualities training of us to think of especially black and brown people women, non-binary people, children, as abled before they are disabled. Because abled, the word abled, is very much tied to being capable to perform the tasks of colonial capitalism. And if someone is likely to have PTSD or chronic pain or nerve damage or any of the other things that I personally have and a lot of people around the world have as a result of violence, then that violence has to come to the fore. And yet these paintings by Gauguin are valued at millions and millions of pounds. There is an exhibit in the National Gallery recently about Gauguin that did not address any of these concerns about him being an abuser in any real way. 
Um, and it goes to show that these patterns of disbelieving black and brown people in particular about our pain are very much rooted in colonial visual cultures in the art industry. Um, the second interpretation, aside from that woman's interjection about Brookfields, is that there is a review of my ICA piece um, by an older white man for um, a publication that I very much respect. And I was very um, honored to have been reviewed there. And I, I understand that the review was by and large extremely positive, which I was very happy for. However, um, this review is very painful for me to read because there was a point in, at which this older white man said, oh, I, sh I really should have tackled the 1965-66 genocide in Indonesia, which if you don't know, was caused by US imperialist interest during the Cold War. And they sparked off a genocide of um, uh, suspected communists, quote unquote, which means labor organizers, feminist, anybody leftist, ethnic and sexual minorities, et cetera. And the thing was I had, <laughs> I had put in actually a lot of stuff about the genocide and the reason why it, it's still very traumatic to me is because that genocide enabled um, a 33 year dictatorship of Suharto's new order regime, which I was born under and which I was educated under until the age of, you know, until um, my being in my tween years and that education was very traumatic and violent as a result of this dictatorship. But because of having lived in a dictatorship, there are cues and clues and subterfuge and, and code words and things that the Indonesian people who are at the ICA understood, but this white reviewer did not. And it was already so um, nerve wracking for me to do that because there is still retribution against people who um, go against even the memory of the new order regime in Indonesia today. Even in the UK, I've had to publish things under the title anonymous um, on my family's request for our safety. And there are songs, there's a song I sing in this, in on a nomenclature that I have musician friends who they will be kicked out of a venue in Indonesia if they sing that song, because it's a women's labor organizer song and it's seen as communist or leftist. So every time I sing that song, there's an element of me that is very fearful, but also it's part, it's cathartic. It's a catharsis of my own childhood trauma, right? Under the dictatorship. And it was, I think I cried when I read the Art Asia Pacific Review and that particular paragraph because I realized that even when I'm being cathartic about my own trauma caused by US imperialism and all of these forces, it will still be refracted through the very assumptive and ableist uh, viewpoint of um, a quote unquote abled white man. And uh, I think that those assumptions are very common with regard to work from exploited communities and what we and the the strategies that we've had to undergo to keep things secret and still resist so thank you for your time and i really look forward to our discussion in regret groups later and i'm looking forward to miles's talk thank you thank you karani miles could we um, turn to you Hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Hamad, for the introduction earlier, and thank you, Kairani, for that very powerful um, talk. And thank you to Contemporary Art Society for inviting me along today. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, I was appointed last September as the curator of the legacies of slavery and empire at Glasgow Museums on a two-year contract funded by Museum Gallery Scotland. So um, I've started this job under lockdown and have still barely be, uh, been inside any of our museums uh, since starting and not really seen the bulk of our collection. So it's a bit weird giving this talk, but I'm going to do my best. Um, the main purpose of my job is to uh, plan and coordinate how Glasgow museums better address the legacies of the transatlantic slave trade and the British Empire. Um, for those who don't know, Glasgow Museums manages several museums on behalf of the City Council, um, which include Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum, which is the very nice picture in the background there. Um, also Riverside Museum of Transport and the Gallery of Modern Art. Um, today I'm going to focus on some existing interpretation in Kelvin Grove Art Gallery, 
and museum, um, which is probably Glasgow Museum's flagship museum, if you like, um, and it is very much a Victorian museum of empire that doesn't particularly uh, address British imperialism to the extent that I think it should. Um, I think, like most people, my own anti-racist practice is by and large based on other people's expertise and experiences. And it's something that I'm still learning and still developing. And I hope that I'll be able to learn from you guys in the conversations that we have um, following this. Um, but I'm just here to think about how we can apply anti-racist practice within the context of our museums and in our interpretation. Um, so for this presentation, I have to particularly credit Zandra Yemen, who's the curator of Discomfort at the Hunterian, um, and Dr. Rosie Spooner, who's a lecturer in museum studies at the University of Glasgow, who really kicked off my thinking around Kelvin Grove's interpretation. Um, for my work, the first step towards addressing the legacies of transatlantic slavery and um, the British Empire was to ask people um, how they think we should address these subjects. And that is particularly people um, who are aware of the issues affecting Glasgow's communities and particularly communities of colour who were most negatively impacted by the legacies of slavery and imperialism. Um, so we've been doing consultation and we continue to do consultation uh, with local community groups, charities, um, activists to get a better understanding of what we need to do as an institution. Um, and although we haven't finished analysing it, I thought I would show you some of the key findings that we are beginning to pick up already, um, which relate to interpretation. One of which is telling the whole picture of the histories involved, um, not just selecting more palatable versions for our, um, for our perceived audience and interpreting it in seemingly objective ways, which actually amount to avoiding discomfort and therefore end up just holding, uh, upholding the status quo. People also wanted to know the truth of how Glasgow benefited from um, imperialism and slavery, and that's warts and all. They didn't want this to be sort of um, coddled up in more comfortable language. They wanted the hard truth. Um, people very much wanted to know the contemporary consequences of imperialism and slavery, especially with a focus on racism and white supremacy, how these ideologies came about and how they shaped and still shape our societies. And as we know, um, understanding racism, how racism operates is a vital part of being anti-racist. You can't be anti-racist without understanding racism. So we have to think about how that, how that works in through our interpretation and through our displays. Um, People also wanted to connect with the experiences of enslaved and colonized people. Um, they didn't want these histories being told entirely through the perspective of enslavers, merchants, colonizers, while enslaved and colonized people are treated as footnotes to a white man's history. So those are just some of the key themes that we're beginning to see. Um, I'm sure we all knew this, but it's interesting to see so clearly that adopting anti-racist practices actually meets the needs of our audiences. So now we're beginning to think about how this feedback applies in some of our spaces. One of those spaces I'm going to focus on today um, is a display in the gallery at the top right of this floor plan called the Glasgow Stories. Um, the reason why I'm gonna focus on that is because it's one of the few spaces in Kelvin Grove that directly addresses the transatlantic slave trade. And it does so in a small corner that can easily be avoided by visitors, if I'm honest. And the British Empire isn't particularly mentioned uh, very much in this gallery at all, even though it's, in my opinion, very integral to the story of Glasgow. So, the way I see this gallery is that it's quite a comfortable gallery, um, which perhaps doesn't want to dent people's pride in being Glaswegian, or it doesn't want to portray Glasgow in a negative light to people who come into the city and come in to visit the museums. Um, but as people have told us through this, uh, through consultation, that they want the truth, um, they don't want their history to be whitewashed in any way, 
they want to see us being anti-racist so we have to think how do we live up to that um, just to note before we actually get to the displays um, I'm, I'm critiquing existing interpretation and thinking about what anti-racist interpretation might include rather than saying that this is what we're actually going to do these are the words that we're going to rewrite the interpretation into um, Kelvin Grove and uh, some of our other museums need to go through a whole process of understanding their own role as colonial institutions and how we can better in, embed the subjects of empire and slavery across the museum and adopt anti-racist approaches beyond just in updating interpretation. But with that being said, that might involve new interpretation, it might involve entire new displays or a new gallery. We will see this as part of the process that we're going through at the moment. Um, I'm also just going to apologise in advance for the terrible pictures you're about to see. Um, I took these the last time I managed to go into Kelvin Grove before I had any inclination that I might be doing a workshop on this subject and haven't managed to go back since because of lockdown. Um, and also the photos are just of the interpretation rather than the surrounding collections, which is a bit frustrating, but I'll try my best to remember what objects are involved as we go through. Uh, anyway, to ha let's have a look at some of the displays. Um, so this display seems to be about the role of commerce in Glasgow's prosperity as a city. Um, the only object it seems to be interpreting is these two sculpted heads, which used to adorn the town hall. At present, the text says that Glasgow's expansion in the 1700s was largely driven by good town planning and solid business management, which Glasgow does have an excellent town plan. I do quite agree with that, but I think um, an anti-racist and more truthful explanation would explain how Glasgow's expansion was fueled by the exploitation of enslaved black people and the extraction of resources through the transatlantic slave trade and the British Empire, neither of which are mentioned at all. The interpretation also says that Glasgow's tobacco industry survived and America still did business with its merchants following the American War of Independence. But I would argue that the more important story is that while American independence meant freedom from British rule for white Americans, it didn't mean freedom for hundreds of thousands of enslaved people who were still forced to work and die to produce the tobacco that made Glasgow rich. Um, lastly, the interpretation credits the strong leadership of Lord Provost Arthur Connell, but it doesn't mention that Arthur Connell was a sugar merchant who profited hugely from the enslavement of black people and was thus able to invest his wealth in the city, whereas perhaps that's something it should say. This display doesn't ignore transit slavery, uh, transatlantic slavery altogether, which is good. Um, but I wouldn't say it quite grasps the whole picture either. For example, it doesn't talk about how much Glasgow benefited. Um, it doesn't talk about the impact on and the experiences of enslaved people. These things are almost a footnote to the display. Um, again, there's no actual objects um, present here to interpret whereas perhaps there are objects that could have been included in this display. Um, the text itself is about how Glasgow grew through the 18th century through migration, which again is true, um, but a key factor of that migration, not the only factor, but a key one, is the opportunities created by the Industrial Revolution, which was a revolution based on the exploitation of human and natural resources around the world. It could also talk about how at the beginning of the century, Scotland and England signed the Act of Union, allowing Scots greater access to what was now the rapidly growing British Empire. We could talk about um, some of the racist ideologies of that empire here or elsewhere, whereas we don't. We could talk about how the empire operated, the role of Scots within it, and so on. I think then we have to ask, is international businessmen the best way to describe people who profited immensely from the enslavement of black people. Should we not lead with the human cost of their international business? Then we have two seemingly innocent facts. Um, plantation slaves were brutally treated, um, which is true, and workers were exploited in Britain, which is also true. 
but should these two statements be unpacked separately and given more time? Um, the reason why I say this is we know that people today like to diminish the experiences of enslaved people by saying, but the Scots were exploited too, but Brits lived in poverty. Um, what about Irish slaves and so on? Are we just feeding into that narrative here? Is there a better way to tackle the subject of local exploitation without comparing it to the enslavement and dehumanization of people because of the color of their skin? And talking of which, where is the mention of the role of race and racism in transatlantic slavery here? I'm sure as we all know that you can't be anti-racist without identifying the role of race in inequalities and injustices. And so you can't write an anti-racist interpretation while ignoring race altogether. And to what is possibly my favorite display here, um, celebrating uh, Scots abroad, those uh, well-known intrepid travelers. Um, just to start that this display does actually interpret some objects, which are mostly natural history collections from memory. Um, but the title itself makes the nature of these travelers seem so innocent, as if they weren't involved in systems of racial violence, either directly or indirectly. So just to be clear that these Scots abroad were colonizers in one shape or another. Um, Victorian collectors and missionaries were involved in colonization alongside soldiers, explorers and merchants. They were involved in spreading white supremacist ideas, whether they intended to or not, in that the message they carried was that whiteness as an ideology is the only route to civilization and power. But in this display, the Scots abroad are made out to be like a bunch of backpackers who came back with some nice things without even questioning whether they should have taken those nice things in the first place. Um, one other example I just wanted to throw in here was this bust that is just outside the Glasgow Stories Gallery. I wanted to bring this up partly because it's um, a contemporary art sculpture and partly because it shows the impact of having little to no interpretation. This is a bust of Sergei Singh, sculpture, uh, sculpted by Alexander Stoddart in 2005. For those who don't know, Sergei Singh was murdered in North Lanarkshire in 1998 in a racist attack. Two prosecutions were unsuccessful and there was a subsequent inquiry which identified the role of institutional racism in the police and the prosecution in the failure to convict. It wasn't until 2016 that any convictions were made. Now this bus sits in Kelvin Grove amidst several white men who may or may not have achieved significant things, as well as Herodotus who sits just outside the frame to the right. Um, all the interpretation says is that it's Sergei Singh and his bust was sculpted by Alexander Stoddart. And you have to ask what message does that give? Do you think that as a result visitors stop and think about the significance of this person's life or death? Um, does it help visitors understand the very real and fatal impacts of racism? I don't know exactly what the interpretation should say here. Um, it is obviously a sensitive story and his it's not a case that happened in the distant past. His family is still in Glasgow and they would still come into contact with this, um, with his bust. But not saying anything is equal to ignoring racism, which is doing nothing to uh, dismantle racist structures, the racism that affects people's lives and ultimately has the potential to kill people. Lastly, I just wanted to come back to the feedback we received about um, addressing these subjects from the perspectives of enslaved and colonized people, rather than just through narratives of enslavers, colonizers and merchants. 
while we do have some historic collections that can speak to these narratives, we have to acknowledge that history has left its own legacy and it's largely recorded from the, um, from the perspectives of white men rather than people who were oppressed. In thinking about how we address this imbalance, I personally think that contemporary art has an important role to play. And one, of, one example I wanted to show you was this object, um, which is part of a collection of Arisha figures by the Cuban artist Filiberto Mora. Um, Kelvin, um, Glasgow Museum acquired these, I think it was in 2003 or around about then. Um, and for those who don't know, Arishas were originally deities from several indigenous West African religions. This sculpture here depicts um, this sculpture here depicts the Arisha Osain, who originally belonged to the Yoruba religion of Ifa. He is a god of nature and healing, amongst other things. However, this specific sculpture is from the religion of Santeria, which is mainly practiced in Cuba and is a mixture of Roman Catholicism and Ifa. Santeria primarily developed out of the experience of enslavement by the Spanish, but it is also one of many syncretic religions across the Americas that emerged out of similar circumstances. Now, just to make this absolutely clear, this isn't me trying to put a positive spin on slavery. That's, I'll leave that to the UK government to do that. Um, for me, this object shows the incredible resilience of enslaved people. Um, it shows that their descendants fought hard to maintain a connection to the continent of Africa, which that a connection which survives to this day. And that is a connection that survives despite centuries of systemic attempts to dehumanize enslaved people and their descendants and eradicate their cultures and identities. And I think that in itself is an important story to tell. And I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Miles and Kairani. Um, as you're, everybody is sort of gathering their, their thoughts and questions, maybe I can sort of, um, use this as an opportunity to pose a couple of my own. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of start with this idea of um, interpretation and its sort of twin mediation with uh, one of the examples that uh, you brought to our attention, Karani, and in, in just in terms of um, the context of the 65 um, uh, sort of communist uh, genocide um, and how uh, the, the critic was not able to, to read um, the coded language with which you were um, referring to it. Um, and I wondered as to, uh, you know, in that work or your work largely, how you think about um, making these contexts visible? You know, what is your approach to mediation? How much do you want your work to be an invitation for different audiences to engage? And what kind of bridges do you, or working with the institution, leave for these audiences to kind of come and engage with your work? Mm, those, those are very good questions. Um, first of all, thank you, Miles, for that wonderful <laughs> presentation. Um, I, I'm quite ambivalent about um, who has access to the coded language itself. Because on the one hand, I think the subterfuge and the codes that we have developed over decades are really precious to us as ways to, you know, it's like me writing as anonymous, right? It's a way for me to transmit information and knowledge without harming myself um, or people around me. Um, and on the other hand, it's also quite violent for a reviewer who is white and male, for instance, to assume that there's nothing in that you know, um, half hour performance installation about something that really affected, you know, my generations of people where I come from. So I think, um, I think it's fine for coded language to remain coded and affect, I think it was very special for me to know, to have a connection with Indonesian people in the audience who understood like, oh my God, you're doing this song. Oh my God, like that is a reference to this, right? Um, I think the issue is when there's the assumption that coded that richness in within coded language does not exist. 
I think that's the difference. I think it's a, I think it's a violent interpretation to say it's such a, first of all, also the reviewer said that it would be, it, it was a shame I didn't touch on the genocide. Number one, I mean, I, I should have said just because we're Indonesian doesn't mean every single artwork we do has to be about the genocide. Not at all. Right. And that's also something that's quite, um, I, I disagreed with that. And then secondly, I, I just think that um, what an assumption to make that that uh, all knowledge about oppression is there for white people to understand when we've had to hide it from white people to survive, you know? So I think um, I'm actually all right with keeping some things coded, but just for wider audiences and white whiter audiences <laughs> to understand that you may not understand everything because of the danger that your people have put us in, and that's okay. But don't make that assumption. Just a quick follow up on that, if I may, Karani. In terms of the institutions that you've shown your work in, has there been an, an instance or, or two where you sort of, and you don't have to name any names, where you've um, felt that they got that mediation right? You know, so in terms of signaling that there may be some codes here. Um, and making resources available for people to enter into that work if they so if they so wish to do so, because it's also perfectly okay not to read something with all its codes and and just sort of in, enjoy it uh, at its superficial layer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, not really. I mean, the ICA was very generous in terms of allowing me to do uh, this work and say the things that I said during it, but. Um, I think that leaving things open to how I wanted the work to be presented it was also um, an important part of that. And things like I asked for beanbags to be placed all around the space because when I enter an art space, I often need to lie down and I don't always feel welcome to do that. So every time I do a performance, there's either beanbags or rugs or blankets that I request specifically to be placed all around so people can enjoy it while lying down. And that in itself is an intervention that I think um, gets people even thinking with their bodies differently if you're approaching something from a place of comfort and then you realize oh in other art spaces I may not have been given access to this comfort and what does it say about what art spaces maybe intend us to be feeling like or operating like as viewers so it's more that that I that I have appreciated thank you Miles, um, thank you for sharing what, what seems like sort of, um, you know, the core of your work as, as to what you're doing. But I was really struck by, um, in your introduction, you pointing to the fact um, that your post is for two years. Um, and, and just what it then sort of um, reveals on this idea that the, the legacies of slavery and empire can be tackled um, on your admittedly broad shoulders uh, on, on, in two years. How do you sort of square that circle? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, so yeah, to start by, we're absolutely not gonna address all the issues around the legacies of slavery and empire in the next few years. And I do have, but I do have to remind people of that. Um, it is difficult and there is only one of me and we have a very big um, museum service. So the way that I'm seeing that, that I have been uh, approaching it so far is to just kind of say yes to everything, to speak to all the different teams um, and to talk through their ideas without necessarily committing to doing things with them, um, but just to sort of share knowledge that they have about the collection, about the areas, things that they've done and where possible to share what I've been doing. But I think I do have to try and get the balance between trying to implement long-term change in the institution and achieving things that are actually possible to achieve within the next two years. Um, so the way I've, that the way that I'm hoping to approach that is by doing things like the consultation, which will be being shared more widely with the organization over the coming weeks and months and thinking about how other teams can take forward some work based on the consultation, um, which I'm sure Martin will be uh, uh, listening to and you'll probably be completely bored of it by then um, but sort of sharing responsibility I think is really important um, but for my work it's kind of now beginning to as well focus on areas that I think are perhaps most important within the next two years and things that we can do in the next two years as well which I will be aiming to focus on Kelvin Grove if I'm completely honest um, because as I mentioned for me it's 
it's very much a museum of empire. Um, it was actually originally a townhouse of a tobacco lord who was also another Lord Provost of Glasgow, known as the father of Glasgow. Um, it was then um, demolished and built the new building, but the, the funds that created the new building were from an empire and industry exhibition. Um, and it brought together all these collections. So I think that empire and slavery are both very integral to Kelvin Grove, but it's not particularly directly addressed to the extent that I think it should be. So we're beginning to think about how we can um, change that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I'll encourage you to sort of ask any questions if you have them. If there are no questions, maybe I can pose one that um, I think both of you may have an answer to. And, and um, really struck by that example, Miles, that you shared of contemporary art um, and its potential to kind of speak with in, in multiple voices. And, and your work, Kairani, also, although you weren't performing with that work hanging on the wall, there was a very direct conversation with the kinds of works that, that hang there. And, and really just the ethics of, um, if you like, of, of deploying the contemporary artist, um, you know, the terms of the invitation, um, you know, there is, if you like, a, a certain kind of practice, which is uh, inviting artists into these problematic, difficult spaces and, and getting them to do some, some kind of, you know, exorcism uh, as if, a, a, a performance, a work which hangs there for you know three weeks, a month, three months, will will do something and then kind of disappear. And I wonder if, from both your perspectives, if you have anything to share with us before we get to our breakout rooms. Um, I'll I'll just speak a little, and then I, I'm looking forward to hearing from Miles as well. Um, I realized when I uh, was wheeled around the National Gallery for their Gauguin exhibition not long after I finished my PhD by practice that I, I felt very futile <laughs> in all the work I'd been trying to do because of the overwhelming power that the, the mythos of Gauguin is given. Um, but I think in terms of the Anna nomenclature exhibition in particular, I think that's why I was re-inscribing the outline in white throughout the duration of the performance to mark my own complicity and how we are in discussing this painting and, and even showing it, we are in ourselves, you know, um, perhaps at ethical odds with liberation in just reproducing that painting and just, you know, speaking about it at, in a colonial institution. And that's something I think about a lot. Yes, I think it's an interesting question. and. As I said, one of the challenges that we do have is that people are very interested in the perspectives of enslaved people, of colonized people, um, and oppressed people when talking about these histories. And we do have some, as I mentioned, some collections to support that. But I think contemporary art, when brought together with some historic collections or historic subjects, can, um, I think, as I said, offer different perspectives, different voices, and different ways of imagining those. Um, circumstances and creating emotional connections, I think, with the people that we're that we're talking about. Um, but I think it also goes beyond contemporary art. I was at a really good symposium with the Rights Museum. They're talking about their new transatlantic slavery exhibition um, just last week, and they were talking about all the different kinds of um, art forms, historic practices that you can bring together to better um, recenter the narrative. Um, and it's talking about things like cartography, uh, poetry, um, storytelling, as well as contemporary art and all these different ways that we can explore these subjects and make these connections with the people involved. And it's something that I'd be very interested in seeing what we can do with Glasgow Museum. Miles, we have one question for you from Natasha Howes at the, the Manchester Art Gallery. Um, you know, firstly, just looking at the fact that two years is not a lot of time to do too much um, so and what's a huge job so which galleries will you be prior prioritizing even within Kelvin Grove how do you make those decisions yeah no absolutely um, and it won't be a complete revamp it, the way that I'm kind of seeing it is starting off a process um, so 
what we're doing at the moment is beginning to understand the scale and what needs to be done um, and the different areas where this perhaps would be most effective. Um, a key question as well being whether this should be a separate space or this should be something that we aim to integrate across the existing spaces um, or something in between. And I think with this, we're, we're gonna have to work with partners. We're gonna have to do more consultation and see what ultimately will be the most um, satisfactory solution there. But then when we actually get to doing it, in terms of doing it in the next two years, it will be thinking about, okay, what interventions can we do in that time frame rather than how can we transform the whole space? And then we'll be thinking about how can we build on those interventions? How can we continue those conversations and um, continue to sort of make people aware of the legacies of slavery empire, but also the museum's connections to those um, histories. Thank you. I think I think there's going to be a whole certainly this Zoom screen, and I'm sure many others uh, that you've been speaking to, Miles, will be looking forward to seeing what uh, what you end up doing. Uh, and I'm sure there will be follow up uh, discussions that we can have um, uh, on that. On that, it is time for our um, uh, a break. Um, so we will now have a short break for 10 minutes. Um, we encourage you to keep your Zoom meeting open, but just sort of sit, switch off your mics and camera if you need to step away. And then when you come back at 1.40, you'll automatically be uh, placed into different breakout uh, groups, and that will be for an hour. Um, with that, uh, and a final sort of, uh, and really sort of heartfelt thanks to Karani and Miles for sharing those wonderful case studies uh, to, to get the mind worrying. Thank you.